morning. Can we hear for our worship team this morning? Amen. 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 And uh, thank, a special thanks to Chris for joining us. Uh, Chris is normally our uh, pianist, organist in the second service, and he busted a move this morning. Amen. Amen. So thank you, Chris, for joining us. And so I'm Lou. I'm one of the pastors here, and um, I'm excited to be here this morning as we kick off a brand new series. And so uh, if you're here for the first time, we want to welcome you, whether you're in person or if you're online, uh, we would love for you to share this to your feed, to comment, uh, to like, to let, let us know that, uh, where you're watching from and who all is watching. Uh, but it is good to be together as we tackle this new series from Life Church called Dangerous Prayer. Everybody say that together, Dangerous Prayer. And so um, I don't know about you, but I've prayed very few probably dangerous prayers. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about uh, what does that look like in the world today? And so real fast, before we start, show of hands, how many of you believe that there is power in prayer? Amen, amen, there's power in prayer, right? Now, show of hands, how many of you believe that you could pray more or on a more regular basis? Show of hands. Yeah, I think all of us, right? And, uh, and I didn't grow up in the church. I found the church later on uh, in high school. And uh, there is one youth group message that has stuck with me uh, since then, and it's about prayer. Now, I have no idea why. But I want to share with you what I remember. Alliteration was really popular uh, a while ago, and so it's the seven P's of prayer. Doesn't that sound exciting to you? The seven P's of prayer. So you ready? You might want to write this down. It'll stick with you. Seven P's. Practiced private prayer promotes perfect public prayer. Why I remember that 20-something years later, I have no idea. No idea. And I can tell you that even today, I struggle with a regular practice of prayer. Maybe you feel the same. I can also with confidence tell you, I have never had a perfect public prayer. Amen? And so why is it, uh, what is it about prayer that makes it so difficult for you and I when we know there's huge power through Christ in prayer? Uh, maybe uh, you know people like I know people who are deeply committed to prayer. You have people like that in your lives. I shared uh, within this church uh, several times, one of my first mentors when I started working in the church down South Florida was a man named Werner Birklin. And uh, Werner was, uh, uh, was one of those people that was very unassuming. And at a huge risk to his family, to their livelihood, even to their lives, he was a missionary in China. He was actually born as a child of a missionary in China with China, China Inland Mission in the 1930s and has continued to do ministry in China when it was very dangerous to bring the gospel into that community. And so even to this day, uh, Werner passed away just uh, two years ago, but his son uh, Eric carries on that mission with China Partner. And um, he was quiet, he was very kind, he was extremely generous, he was very unassuming, but all of that was wrapped in this unbelievable bold prayer package. If you wanted something to happen, you would go to Werner and you would ask him to pray for it. And when we experience bold prayer, maybe you've experienced this, we begin to question how safe our own prayers have become. I, I know I do. I know I can get in a rut where I pray for things that are very safe. I pray for things that uh, help me stay comfortable, right? And when I do that, I begin to miss. I begin to miss what God is doing all around me. I miss my role in what this kingdom work is, is happening all around me. Henry Nouwen, I love Henry Nouwen, and so you'll hear a couple of Henry Nouwen quotes this morning, but in his book, uh, Love in a Fearful Land, he describes it this way. He says, prayer is, both, uh, is the way to both the heart of God and the heart of the world precisely because they have joined through the suffering of Jesus Christ. Praying is letting one's own heart become the place where the tears of God's children merge and become tears of hope. And so let us place ourselves this morning boldly in this place where transformation happens in God's kingdom. And so will you pray with me this morning? Let's pray. Jesus, this morning we let go of our need to be safe and secure. 
and we welcome you in this place. Jesus, today we let go of our need to be accepted and approved of. We welcome you in this place. Jesus, we let go of our need to control persons or events in our lives. And we welcome you in this place. Jesus, we let go of our need to change reality. Allow us to receive it as it is, as we welcome you in this place. In the powerful name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen. So our dangerous prayer today comes from the book of Acts, uh, this story of the early church. And maybe you've read through Acts. It's an amazing book. I would encourage you to go check it out. There's some powerful stuff that happens there. And and we're going to start in the fourth chapter. And to give you some context, because I think context is really important, Peter and John were preaching. And they were preaching with great faith about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, They were going around uh, praying for miracles. And there was this man who had been unable to walk for 40 years. 40 years he had sat in this town, unable to move. uh, People knew he would sit and beg, and and, uh, they prayed for this man. And God miraculously healed him, and he was able to walk. Amen? The only problem is the Sadducees, the temple guards, and some of the religious leaders uh, had a little bit of a problem with that. Uh, They they thought um, Peter and John were leading some kind of weird cult. Maybe you've been accused of leading a weird cult in your life, right? So they accused him of leading some kind of weird cult, and so the leaders arrested um, Peter and John. They put him in prison, and then they put him on trial the next day before the Sanhedrin, and, and they would surround them in a circle. And so Peter and John would be standing in a circle of very important people, and they asked this question. Acts 4, we're going to pick up verse 7. They brought the two disciples and demanded, by what power or whose name? Have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Peter says, Let me clearly state to all of you uh, and to all the people of Israel that he was healed in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man who you crucified, but God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. He says there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So again, some context. I think it's really important. As we look at this story, uh, Peter is basically saying to these important people, you killed him. You did it. But God raised him back. Uh, One of the reasons it's so bold is not necessarily the fact that he accused them of killing Jesus, but when Peter said God raised him from the dead it created some tension. See, Jesus in his ministry had many debates with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And for the most part, the Pharisees, if if you think about it, the Pharisees uh, were uh, most like Jesus. They believed very similar things about God. Um, They were kind of in line with Jesus' thinking. Uh, And they ran the temples. They oversaw religious life. And so um, as you uh, went to temples in towns, the Pharisees were in charge. They gave direction. Uh, But uh, Sadducees were very different. Uh, They held positions of power and authority. And so as you read the Gospels, and Jesus actually gets closer to places of power, he encounters more and more Sadducees. They hold authority, they hold power, they hold influence in the community. The big difference is that the Sadducees did not believe in any form of bodily resurrection. The Pharisees believed that when you died, uh, God would raise your body, um, uh, there would be a full resurrection physically. But the Sadducees believed when you died, that was it. Your body would just lay there and rot. And so when Peter says, you did this, he's speaking to authority. He's speaking to the people that sat in the places that led to the crucifixion of Christ. 
He says, you did this. You in authority, you who lead the people of Israel. But he says, God raised him from the dead. And those words are like picking a fight with the Sadducees. And so what happens is really unexpected. We see verse 13 says, the members of the council were amazed. They were taken aback. They were blown away. They were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training. And they were amazed. They were shocked even. That these regular, uh, sort of normal people were so bold. And one of the things, you maybe heard this, the word uh, ordinary men uh, can be translated a few different ways. They can be unschooled, which they were. It could be ordinary. It could be of no special value. But the, the word that I prefer in the translation is idiots. And so it could read this way. They were blown away and amazed that these idiots who had nothing special about them but were incredibly bold in their faith in Jesus. Does that make you feel more confident as a disciple? Amen? If those idiots can do it, this idiot can as well, right? And so uh, suddenly we see uh, this encounter. They're amazed, but there's still a problem. There's a man, he's actually standing uh, in the room. There's a man standing that couldn't walk for 40 years and now he can And so there's obviously been a miracle, but they're afraid that Peter and John will continue, that they'll go out, that this movement will take over, that it will uh, really uh, cause trouble for them. And so they must shut it down because their most important thing is retaining power. It's a threat to them. And so they say this, the Sanhedrin, the the leaders, those uh, with influence and power, they say, don't ever talk about Jesus Stop doing these miracles. However you're doing them, we don't care. If you talk about Jesus, we're going to arrest you. We're going to beat you. We're going to execute you. Don't talk about Jesus or you will pay. And it's at this moment that they're using their influence, their authority, their power. Maybe you've been in front of somebody um, who has real authority. Or maybe uh, you've been, this happens more to me, you've been in front of people who uh, think they have real authority. Amen? People that say, do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who I am? Have you heard that? And so the, the uh, Sanhedrin is, is using their influence. They're saying, don't, don't ever talk about Jesus again or we're going to kill you. And so what happens, do you think, with Peter and John? They prayed. They prayed. They, they stepped into prayer, and they didn't pray, God, keep us safe. They didn't say, don't let bad things happen to us. They didn't say, hey, we really need a great job, a nice retirement. I want to be happily married. I want to be comfortable. They didn't pray anything like that. But instead, in the face of death, they prayed a very dangerous prayer because following Jesus is never meant to be safe. And they prayed in verse 29, not to the Sanhedrin, but they prayed this to God. It says, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So this is a dangerous prayer. It's saying, make me bold, God. Make us bold. Give us unshakable spiritual conviction that we have the courage and faith to obey, to follow no matter what the personal cost may be. Even if it's painful, God, make us bold in our faith. And all the religious leaders were amazed again by the boldness. And so the question for us today, the question for you and for me and for, uh, for anybody listening online is how amazed are people by your boldness? In a good way, right? How amazed are people When they look at you, do they say, without a doubt, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you are a disciple of Jesus, I can see it in you? Or would they say, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. I didn't didn't know you went to church. Uh, See, Peter and John prayed this uh, prayer in the middle of threats against their life. They said, God, hear their threats, but give us strength. Stretch out your hand, continue to heal, do miracles, miraculous signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. And the crazy thing is right after this prayer, we we read in verse 31, it says, after the prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Now, here's what I love. It's after the prayer, 
that they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they begin to preach the word boldly. It's after. It's after. It's not before. They're, they don't have confidence beforehand. They, they pray. The Holy Spirit moves, and they're given boldness. Now, you may say that I'm not really a, a loud person. I'm not a bold person. I'm pretty timid. I'm shy. I'm quiet. I don't like to really be public about my faith, but I want to tell you from these verses, from a biblical sense in the book of Acts, boldness is not a personality trait. Boldness is not a personality trait. It's when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. They may be naturally quiet. We know Peter isn't, amen, but they may be naturally quiet, and suddenly they're filled with courage. They're filled with the Spirit, and it's not a personality trait. It's the work of God in our lives. And what I love is they prayed, the Spirit came, and they preached with boldness. They didn't wait for it to get easier. They didn't hesitate. And so when we talk about this dangerous prayer, we need to be careful. Because if you pray this prayer, God, make me bold, you may begin to see opportunities to be bold in ways that you've never seen before. God may show you ways that you can be bold uh, in your relationships. You can be bold in your faith, that you can speak up for others. That you can do bold things because of who God is. If you'll let me nerd out for just a second, because I think this is really important. Um, If you take just a little bit of time and you dig a little bit deeper, I think you may uh, understand a little bit better the boldness that's actually happening here. And so give me a second here. Uh, I want to just tell you a couple things. The first is this, if we were to step back, we would realize if we looked at all the New Testament that the three disciples who were in Jesus' inner circle were Peter, James, and John. Now, James and John were brothers. We hear a lot about them. They make kind of fools of themselves. Their mom gets involved, amen? Um, And so Peter and James and John were in the inner circle. And so if we were to step into, say, when Jesus stepped into the, the back room of the synagogue leader, Jairus, whose daughter had just died. The whole family's in mourning. And Jesus steps into this little room and sits down and he speaks word of life over this little girl and she's raised raised from the dead. The only disciples allowed to follow Jesus into that little room, to put their backs against the wall and watch Jesus speak life into death are Peter, James, and John. If we were to go just a little bit further uh, into the gospel, when Jesus was up on a high mountain in what we call the transfiguration, where Elijah and Moses, the greatest of the prophets and the law, appear before Jesus and bow before him. And Jesus shines bright like the sun. Uh, There's a couple different translations. Uh, the, the, The one I love is he's as bright as bleach, right? The, the whitest white you can think of, he, as sunbeams burst through uh, this transfiguration moment, the only disciples invited up to that high mountain were Peter, James, and John. A- after the Last Supper, when Jesus went to the Garden in Gethsemane uh, to pray during the moment of what I think is his greatest agony, as he's really struggling, he's wrestling with what he has to do. He prays in these moments, God, not my will, but your will be done. The three Jesus invited to come a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further during this test of his will were Peter, James, and John. They knew who he was. They had spent time with him. They had seen all the things that Jesus had done in his life. And if you were to push this just a little bit further, you would realize that John was actually the first disciple to follow Jesus. So if you look back in, in Scripture, you'd realize John was the first one to jump on board. And if you went a little bit further, you'd realize that John was actually the last one at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified. And so we have these historical accounts, we have these writings uh, that show John as this. This is how they describe John. They said, John lingers longer and contemplates more deeply than most on the Christ event, the life of Christ, Christ entering our world. So much so that a New Testament scholar, Everett Harrison, puts it this way. He says, John was more alert than the others to the greatness of Jesus and was conscious of being at the center of an apocal transforming movement 
in human history. Now, I don't know about you, but I've looked back on my life and realized, oh man, I didn't, I didn't know I was in the middle of something important. I've looked back and realized like, man, I had no idea that that was going to be important in my life. And, and what they're saying is John was aware in real time in the moment as he walked with Jesus, that he was in the middle of a pivotal transformational movement based on the life of Christ that would change all of humanity. Okay, he was aware of what was going on. Now I say all this, I give you all these details, which you don't need to remember, for this one point. Okay, here's the one point. The ancient Jewish people took prayer very seriously. I hate to break it to you, Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. The disciples, the early men and women that followed Jesus were Jewish people. They may not be schooled the same way uh, Pharisees and other religious leaders were, but they sat under the greatest teacher that ever existed. The Jewish people took prayer very seriously, and, and there are teachings and writings that have survived that show us how seriously they approach prayer. And one of those writings that I'm going to butcher the name, but just go with me, is the Mishnah Berakut. It's a book of blessing, uh, sometimes referred to as the rules of prayer. It's part of the Talmud, and it, it gives very specific details about prayer. It even talks about the Shema, which is the, the central prayer of the Jewish people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That, that Jesus would actually pray morning and evening. He gives details how to do that. And so if you were raising your child in the Jewish faith back then, you would actually go through this uh, this rules of prayer. You would show them how to do it. If you were a, a rabbi taking on disciples, you would go through this book and you would show them, here are the things that you need to do. And this Mishnah emphasizes the intentional awareness of God's presence in prayer. Okay? I promise I'm going somewhere with this. It emphasizes this, uh, God's presence, that before we go to prayer, that we need to know God is with us. We need to know what is going on. And it translates roughly this way. It says, as you go into prayer, know before whom you are standing. Know before whom you are standing. And so for Peter and John, there was no doubt that they were standing not before the Sanhedrin, but before Christ himself. Does that change your idea of bold prayer? So listen to me. The boldness of our prayers is directly related to the realization of whom we stand before. Let me say that again. The boldness of our prayers is directly related to the realization of whom before we stand. Do you realize that the God of the universe is present with you and he claims you as his own and he calls you good? Amen? Or have we let the noise and the negativity of this world, this broken world, make us afraid and ashamed? Where there should be boldness is there fear. Have we confused who we're standing before? Henry Nouwen says this in his book, Life of the Beloved. He says, the real work of prayer is to become silent and listen to the voice that says good things about me. To gently push aside the silence I push aside and silence the many voices that question my goodness and to trust that I will hear a voice of blessing. He says that demands the real effort. That is where we find bold prayer, where we push the, the, the noise of this world away and realize before whom we are standing. Just as Peter and John understood who they were standing before. So we ask God, make us bold in our prayers. And I want to tell you that boldness in faith, I would love to say that it removes opposition, but in fact, the opposite is true. For Peter and John, uh, they walked freely from that Sanhedrin trial. They actually walked out. They carried on. They preached the good news. They healed people. There was miracles happening, but they were attacked again. They made some other religious leaders angry, and they were arrested. And so there's three things that sort of show up, three attributes that happen with boldness. The first is a boldness almost always triggers a spiritual oppression. If you don't believe me, ask Jesus. And so we find in Acts a little bit later in chapter 5 that they were arrested, they were thrown into jail. In public jail, they were humiliated. 
But boldness often uh, actually releases God's miracles as well. We see as soon as they're thrown in jail that night, an angel comes and actually opens all the doors and lets them out. And boldness requires faith. Because the angel opens all the doors to let them out and says to them, not run, hide, but says this, go to the temple and give the people the message of life. And so at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple and they were told, uh, as they were told, and immediately began teaching and preaching. So let me tell you what happens to Paul and John. You may know this, but uh, they prayed boldly. They lived an incredibly bold life for Jesus, but historians tell us that John was actually arrested. He was dipped in boiling oil for his faith. It was designed to kill him because it killed everyone else, but for some reason, John survived. He was tortured and exiled. He was uh, disfigured. He was excommunicated to the Isle of Patmos where he spent the rest of his life alone writing about the goodness of God. Peter, we know, according to first century sources, was martyred in Rome. And, and uh, we see uh, tradition tells us that when he went to be crucified, he said, uh, would you crucify me upside down? He said, I'm, not, uh, I'm unworthy to die the same way as my Savior. And so he's actually hung upside down. And that was his reward for bold obedience. So God, make me bold is a dangerous prayer. Because obedience and boldness almost always triggers spiritual oppression. So we shouldn't worry when we face oppression. We should worry when we don't. See, if we know Jesus, if we're forgiven, we should be bold. We want to be bold. We ought to be bold with our faith, with our prayers. You don't care about opposition. It's because you want others to, to feel the freedom and grace that you have through God. And so the question is, what would happen? What would happen if you prayed in your life, make me bold? What if we prayed as a church, make us bold? What would God do in your relationships, in your families? What would God do in your communities, your neighborhoods, your workplace? If we pray, make us bold. Remember, it's a dangerous prayer, but it's one that we should lean into because we see time and time again the disciples, the ones who knew before whom they were standing, the God that walked this earth, that they shared a meal with, they continually prayed, God, make us bold. And so uh, today, as we uh, get ready to, uh, to wrap up our service, as we get ready to go out, as we get ready to do all the things uh, to get ready for the week, I want to encourage you a couple things. The first is there's a, a, a Bible reading plan that, that comes with this series. It's seven days. I want to encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's called the uh, Dangerous Prayer, and we'll be sending out links. Uh, you can follow along and, and check that out. It's an amazing thing. But I want to, I want to say, if you're tired... If you're tired of being afraid, if you're tired of being ashamed, if you're tired of letting the voices of this world tell you that there is no goodness in you, and you're wanting to listen, you're wanting to hear the voice of the one true God tell you that you are good, that you have been claimed, I want to invite you today to start with bold prayer. We're going to take some time just before communion this morning, before we uh, go to the table for grace, to go before God boldly. We're going to ask, just like Peter and John, for God to stretch out his hand of healing, to show miraculous signs and wonders in our lives, to give life where there was death, to give hope where there was suffering. And so this morning, I want to invite you. We're going to take a few minutes. You can, uh, the altar rail is here. I'm happy. I'm going to be up front praying for anybody who would like prayer. You can make your, your seat an altar to pray a bold prayer. And whatever it may be, it may just be, God, make me bold. It may be, God, make me bold in my family. God, make me bold in my work. Allow me to speak up for those who don't have a voice. And so, Father, I pray for this church. I pray for a church full of Jesus followers, bold and courageous in dangerous prayer. God, allow this day to be the start 
of a journey where we follow you through dangerous places, bringing the good news. And all God's people said, amen.